Well, thank you for the very nice and kind introduction. And thank you so much for putting the conference together. I apologize for being late, lame and doing this from Chicago rather than coming over. Toronto always had a super soft spot in my heart because as a Canadian immigrant, of course, my journey started there. And moreover, where you are now is really close to our entire family here because my wife, a proud Trinity graduate, was born in Toronto General and then about 25 years ago gave birth to our two daughters when we were living in Toronto at Toronto General. They don't have opt-in anymore, so that that uh, suite is certainly broken. And I used to just live north of where you all are and cycle down St. George to Bay Street when I started working. So the talk today, I was fearful, might be super esoteric. And I think um, uh, I had relatively niche topics, but maybe I can convince you that it's not all that niche um, after all. So I'm talking about how to get from CRAN to Ubuntu with less pain. And there's a bit of context that I'm coming to as well. Um, as you mentioned, I'm really by professional uh, software engineer now after having been in quant and finance for the longest time. But what I highlight here in orange is that for some reason or other, I am impossible, it's impossible for me to let go of this task of taking software and packaging it up and making it usable for others. This bug bit me as a graduate student and I have been contributing a lot of statistical stuff I included to Debian where I've been looking after that for about a quarter century. And after being very uh, shy uh, um, and just maintaining other people's software, I started writing some packages and that mushroomed a little and some of them were more successful than others. And yeah, that led to a couple of other projects too. But what I'm really trying to talk about today is where are we with this richness of CRAN and its use in binaries. The most common popular by count method, of course, is to use R on Windows. And on Windows, it's child play. You press a button, binaries install, and you can do your thing. So I found a picture with children playing on a trampoline because it's that easy. You just enjoy the toys you're given, you can bounce around, but the trampoline is apt because you can also get hurt, fall, and you won't have the same experience as soon as you move away from the trampoline. Developing on Windows is a whole different beast. You have to install the compilers, other issues. So there are issues, it's not ideal. Moving on from Windows, what's very popular these days, of course, is the exquisite hardware provided by Apple with um, the software on it. And that too works really, really well. But for some people, myself included, it seems a little restrictive. Things work if you do them exactly the way you're supposed to work and not in others. I was just helping a friend yesterday who was tearing his hair out because all of a sudden he couldn't build RCPP Amadeo on his Mac anymore. Of course, something Fortran, Brew, whatever, it's complicated. I, of course, um, am a Unix nerd and have been working on Unix for as long as I've been, been programming. And there really, I wanted to take this picture from the Narco series with the guy sitting on the on the bench, but that one's copyright, so here's something that we can reuse. In Linux, we're mostly kind of going, ah, wouldn't it be nice to actually have binary packages because there's really only corner solutions. So the gist of this talk is to make the third solution as good as the prior two or ideally better. And this again, just sums up what I just said, sort of on Windows things work with constraints, same with Mac OS. And on Linux, it's more complicated with sort of too many variants. And in general, no universal uh, provision of binaries for all users. Um, so this project, uh, I first called CRAN apt, uh, and then subset of it just out to you for a test. It really actually has a long um, and large context because I'm clearly quite obsessed with all of this and maybe not all this good at it because we've been doing this since the early 2000s. Um, I ran into as as a grad student when I knew C and saw a book with code in there. I saw with open source budding how R was starting and have been observing it since very early days, 96, 97. Been dabbling with it since 98. So I saw what was there then. CRAN had under 100 packages. Uh, so everything was somewhat manageable. And someone in Austria named Albrecht Gebhardt wrote a Perl script that took CRAN packages and actually made binaries out of them. Because um, as we know how CRAN tests things, the build of our packages is actually fairly standardized. 
So once you know how one works, you have the command suite to do for the others. You merely, big quotes around merely, have to set your system up to support the build. So a few of us then picked that up and extended it. Um, and we talked about it at uh, USA 15 years ago. Uh, but that had design limitations. So a revisit was in order. And I put that up as a Google Summer of Code project. Uh, I think at that time I was a Google Summer of Code administrator for R because nobody else was doing it. It was way smaller than it is right now. It has become a huge success with multiple administrators and all the rest of it. And I got a student named Charles Blundell, who, who's an ace, who was then a UCL PhD student. And many people from UCL, including the founder, went on to uh, um, Google Brain and, and uh, that stuff, so him too. And he, he wrote the whole thing back as R scripts, really, really clever, really well. And we had about complete coverage with, at the time, about six or 7,000 packages. And Cran invited me, I went over there. And as I was demoing it, I kid you not, the SQLite database holding the metadata just vaporized and bad as I am in this particular aspect and pre pre GitHub days, I didn't really have um, backups. So that one then stopped. Uh, we had a user 2009 talk. Uh, Don Armstrong is a, a PhD in bioinformatics and in his grad student and postdoc days uh, built a complete archive of Cran and Bioconductor. I know Don via Debian. He's a much more important Debian maintainer than I am and had sort of also took on some administrative and leadership roles and has mostly stayed stayed away from that. But that that worked, and he had a really strong machine with proper rate mirroring of disks and whatever. But they melted as well, and we never got back to building that because setting all this up is a bit it's a bit of work. Parallel work then still exists, and many of us use or have used by Michael Rutter from Penn State, who picked up some of the earlier scripts and made them use the build service from Ubuntu called Launchpad. That's a service where you can upload source and get binaries provided. And that's actually really nice, but it's still partial. It covers about uh, a third of CRAN. And then uh, a few of us got together and wrote a proposal for the R consortium. I was VPI for that. We got funded, but for various reasons, we didn't get the work done because all of this can be a little uh, insurmountable and look large. So concluding from this history retrospective is that, yes, you can build binaries from CRAN, but it's a lot of work, a lot of hard work, but it can be done. Don did it, and a few people do it currently. There is an effort for Fedora, if you use that, instead of Steuer in Hamburg, who's been doing that for a really long time for OpenSUSE, uh, also leaning on an existing build service, and then there's Michael's partial effort. So the conclusion seems to be that you can particular if you have help. Now, the question is, where on earth do we get the help from? Um, um, and in longer talks, I've talked about this twice, sort of for 30, 40 minutes in the last two months, I show a little bit more about the commonalities between a binary Linux package and, uh, and, and an R package, but I think I have to skip this here. Um, so sticking with, I just said, you know, where would we get the help from? Entered um, RStudio or no pose it package manager, uh, branding was RSPM. I still use RSPM throughout the talk. I think there were 200 ppm, and I update that. That appeared on the scene about two years ago, and is quite comprehensive, ambitious, and generally good. Uh, it now also does Python. It's clearly a clever idea to get paying customers to subscribe to the services, and it 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 does a lot. And I pick up the examples that I would have shown had we more time that what you get from RSPM actually is the same thing that R internally has when you use the not so well-known sub option to R command install. Because instead of installing a source package on your system, you can also essentially transform the source tarball into a binary tarball. And RSPM has all of those, but they're naked packages without system integration. And the nice thing that we can do in a distribution and that I know so well because I've been doing this for 25, 30 years is make packages out of that. So RSPM is great. It's super ambitious. It gives you Windows, Mac OS, various Linux flavors across multiple R versions and even across multiple dates, binaries, um, what you get from R command install. However, those binaries are disconnected from system dependencies and that's what we work on here essentially. So it's not integrated. Um, very oddly, some packages are also source and not binary, and there's no flag for that, so I have no idea how that works. 
Oddly, I think it still does not support Debian and it does not support other architectures. So you have to be an Intel CPU. So overall, it's really very good. Um, I just wished it went a little bit further and I'm able, I think, to fill in this little step. So what we now do in R2U is that we're basically taking what RSPM or PPM gives us as an input in the build step. It saves us the actual build, which is huge. And then we're taking this and basically taking it as input into the remaining step of how a binary package is built that analyzes the dependencies and uh, infers them reliably and correctly. And with that, we turn packages without metadata into proper packages with metadata. And that's that's a really big deal. And uh, I'm clearly dim-witted because I had been looking at RSPM and trying to understand how it fits into the landscape for about two years. And it was only this spring that I realized that these binaries without metadata that I get, I could actually use as a building block and build something around. And in essence, I wrote a proof of concept for this in April on two weekends and then started dabbling with that and talked to a few friends for better testing. And I generally got um, thumbs way up and it worked. And yes, yeah, so we've been running with it ever since. And I'm currently serving about five to 10,000 binaries per business day. It's clearly human driven rather than bot driven at the moment. There don't seem to be that many cron drops, but when people test packages or build, it works. And luckily we also have proper internet connectivity um, because I have a mirror um, now that I'm a part-time professor as an, as an adjunct clinical, you get to know and meet some people. So someone uh, on the IT side helped me set that up. So time permitting demo. And I think I will jump in and do this um, um, because I'm showing the desktop. I hope you're seeing this now too. So here I just jumped to AWS for two reasons. They have good network connectivity and decent machines and they're ephemeral, they go away, come and go. And I have one main work instance there and I don't wanna sort of alter that. So on AWS, I just went into a Docker instance just because it can go away. So that is then, and I do not have to type this, preloaded the packages a little. So this is a, a naked Rocker instance for R2U. I'll talk about those a very bit, a bit at the very end. And you see there's basically no packages in it. That's just how it comes. That's the R-based packages that come as well as BSPM, which helps us a little and little, which I like, and but 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 otherwise not. Yeah, that's that's I think. Oh, and then remotes for install because we need that here. So the main demo here now is that I'm going to install both the Tidyverse and Sura, a single cell bioinformatics package with a fair tale of dependencies as well. And I wrap system time around it. And this is now live and without color, live in color without the safety net. So it just goes off. Um, this uses a particular trick from R to U by using the BSBM package, which then maps what we started in R as installed our packages, looking at the R names and maps it to the system packages because the system now has them thanks to this R2U work. And there it just goes off and essentially just in 23 and a half seconds installed well over hundred packages for us with all their dependencies. And that's really, um, that's really quite something. The um, thing where this is ahead of other alternatives that you do not get unless you integrate into the package is that it's really a system integration. If you ever had that, that you built a package and say you wanted string R, which needs string E. And if you have to compile that, you need libicu, which is the library giving you the actual, you know, behavior for working with, with white characters, with UTF-8 characters. Um, on a Linux system, you do all of that with shared libraries. The shared libraries are versioned and uh, numbered. So you may be building then string E against libicu 70, and your system then six months later, 12 months later, may update libicu 70 to libicu 71, removing 70. What has just happened? Well, you just broke your stringy installation because the 70 is hard coded on a, on a Linux system. Other operating systems do all that with static linking and you get full copies, so then you're protected from that. So, um, but on, on Linux, uh, it, it can be an issue. And on, on live systems, rather than one-off systems, say for testing, continuous integration, that can be a real pain. And you really are only safe uh, from that by doing in system integration. Now that stringy is Akran stringy, the system knows that it has a dependency on libicu, a particular version, and it will then not uninstall the version thinking nobody else uses it because it has a knowledge of who uses it. Sounds a little bit like inside baseball, but if you've been bitten by it, it's super frustrating. 
how do you get about using this? It's really relatively straightforward. Um, the image on the right is a screenshot from the setup script and it's really just five steps that I discuss in the readme. Essentially, we have to tell the system which repository to go to for apt. Um, then there's a bit of security happening that we're still not doing on CRAN. So there's the, the, the repository information is cryptographically signed and you need a key to verify that. So you need the, the key for that. Um, then here among the five steps, I have one for making sure that R itself is actually current. So that's just general access of the Ubuntu binaries for CRAN that Michael provides based on my Debian packages. So here that gives you R422. And uh, then we have to do one sort of inside trick to make sure that repository sorts high so that it doesn't have bad interaction with the with the main repository because parallel builds maybe there are certain CRAN packages are also in Ubuntu proper but here we want to express a preference for taking them all from RTU because they're consistently rebuilt. It's not super important but it can help with one or two negative surprises and then as an option we can install BSPM. All of this is provided also as a script you can do the same in containers. I can like containers quite a bit for the demo that I just showed. You can easily bring them up, throw them away, doesn't do anything to you. And I support that in Ubuntu 24 and 22.04, the two most recent long-term support releases. Um, there's also um, a service called gitpod.io uh, where you can register just with your GitHub ID. And it allows you to basically have a shell in a graphical environment inside your browser and when you do that and there's a link on the readme um, you get this docker driven behavior and you can actually play with rtu without installing anything on your machine because it all happens in the cloud and then lastly and maybe the most important use case is you can very easily use it in continuous integration say at github actions or at other services i'm um, bit picky on that and I don't like to bet on a single provider only because we all had that, that we were all running our tests at Travis and then Travis changed the terms of service and wanted everybody to pay. So I very much prefer to have these independent. So I still do everything with a, a script I now maintain uh, that is a successor to what we initially uh, as a community built for Travis and I, and I call that RCI. You can just pull that in set the system up, install the dependencies, that's where remotes come in and, and runs the test and uh, nothing else. I occasionally help people at Stick Overflow or on Twitter or whatever, this installation woes, people who maybe on a Mac otherwise don't know Ubuntu all that well, uh, then have to do CI and they have problems with the dependencies here, it just works. Um, this old software engineering quip that between fast, cheap and reliable designs at any one point, you can pick only two. This one's a really special thing. And until the next set of disks break and it all pulverizes, we really do have fast, cheap, and reliable. It just works. Uh, makes me quite happy. So um, this uh, really makes my day um, because as I showed from the history slide, it's something that I've been at for quite some time. And now you can take advantage of this wherever Ubuntu runs. That can be as in my case on your laptop, desktop server. It can just be in a cloud instance. Ubuntu is very popular on AWS, GCS, Azure. It's quite likely your continuous integration provider because the Linux default at GitHub Actions is Ubuntu. Um, so they're in many places. You can give it a try, give it a spin, and it gives you now all of CRAN, which on a Ubuntu or Debian-based system we didn't have before, with full dependency resolution, which goes a bit beyond uh, what the otherwise uh, very nice RSPM service does. And if you combine it with Inyaki's BSPM package, it's even neater because then you don't have to think in terms of system commands for installation, but your R commands just get mapped. The R technical term is that there's a, a, a trace on the install packages function and it redirects it um, as I showed in the, in the demo. And then something like install packages ggplot2 just magically becomes uh, apt install rcrime ggplot2. Um, so that's that's quite useful, but it's, uh, it's, 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 it's an optional extra feature. RTU really is at the repository level and does not require it. This has all been going pretty well. As I said, I talked to a few friends for testing in May, and that's where we had this near vertical spike when a few of us were really hitting it. And it's been growing steadily ever since. There's a slight change in the slope when at the Chicago R users group, I announced the availability of the mirror that seems to have helped a little. And other than that, it's really important that every talk 
you know, I work in industry has a chart that goes from the bottom left to the top right. And I achieve that here by using cumulative summation of all the downloads. And as of this morning, I guess, when I last summarized it, we seem to have crossed 700,000 packages served. So that's uh, that's quite good. And maybe it'll be uh, useful to um, any of you too. So with that, big thanks to everybody who makes R happen. That is many of us, the package authors, of course, the CRAN team and R core, everybody who has been involved in earlier efforts uh, for binaries from CRAN, R studio, oops, there's a team missing, um, not R studio, R studio posit for RSP and PPM, and Inyaki for BSPM, um, Rami does for helping me set up a, or setting up a VM for me on a proper internet to connect the host. So that's great. And then Pixabay for the pictures. And big thank you, of course, to my uh, 20 or so GitHub sponsors who provide all the coffee that allows me to talk this fast so that I hopefully didn't include my, um, my time uh, allotment here. And you can see all of this, including this Git pod demo, if you just uh, go to the R2U website, which hangs on GitHub pages under my GitHub repos. That's uh, all for me.